Uh, yeah, excellent. So as the, uh, the, my kind introduction mentioned, my name is Nancy Scola. I'm a journalist based here in D.C. who covers technology, politics, public policy. Um, and as we sit here today, it's a pretty consequential time uh, in those fields. We're just over two years into a Biden administration that is really starting to put its stamp on telecommunications and technology, including through some massive multi-billion dollar programs, some of which we'll talk about today. And the question for us is, what will that mean for the United States and for the world in five years and 100 years? We're pretty much the perfect person uh, to discuss that with today. Alan, thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here. Thank you for being here. Um, Alan, so let's just dive in. If you'll indulge me in a little bit of history, um, NTIA has been around for 45 years now, about as long as I've been around. Um, but the law creating it says it exists to promote the benefits of technological development in the United States and act as the executive branch agency primarily responsible for advising the president on telecommunications and information policies. I've spoken with one of your predecessors as NTI administrator preparing for this panel, and this person said, quote, the remit of the administrator role is so broad, it means whatever you want it to mean. <laughs> what does it mean to you? Wow, would that were true? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so what does it mean to me? So I think the key point to underline there is um, uh, we serve as the president's principal advisor on telecommunications and information policy. And that means a whole bunch of different things. Um, part of it is uh, really operational for us. And so we have a couple of big roles, which you mentioned. First and foremost, uh, connecting everybody in America with uh, high-speed, affordable internet service. We've gotten, we're administering $50 billion in, uh, in federal funding for, uh, out of the bipartisan infrastructure law. We have a big role on spectrum uh, and coordinating federal spectrum. It's a big operational role, as well as uh, thinking about spectrum policy and making sure that we have a spectrum pipeline that makes sure that everybody has access to spectrum. And then advising on policy, both domestically and internationally. And for me, I think that's actually one of the ex most exciting growth areas um, for NTIA. This whole conference is about this, comp this in, in, in growing need for more insight and more engagement on the big policy issues that now affect so many people in society. And NTIA has a central role in thinking about privacy, uh, competition, um, mis and disinformation, cybersecurity, um, and emerging technology. And you're 13, you've been in office 13 months so yes. far. How almost far, 14. Almost 14. How <laughs> far along are you in creating the NTIA that you want uh, the agency to be? Are you 20% along the way, 80% along the way, somewhere in between? So maybe somewhere in between. I have to say it's been an amazing year, um, a huge year of growth for NTIA. Uh, when I came on, we there was a, a lot of growth needed. So uh, part of that is in our broadband work, but part of it, other parts of it that just needed to be, uh, that we needed to refresh the ranks. A third of NTIA is brand new since I started in January of last year. So a third new. So that, that's like a startup. In government, it is really unusual to hire a third of your organization brand new. So we are growing and we continue to grow. And I'm really excited for the coming year because last year was a big growth year. This year we can really, we have the team in place and we can start executing. Okay. And a big reason for that growth, as you mentioned, is this broadband money that you've been right. uh, gifted, that you have oversight <laughs> over uh, some $40 billion plus, which is a good amount of money even for the United States government. The idea is to build out affordable, effective uh, broadband uh, connections for everyone living in the United States of America. Why do, I'm gonna ask a very sort of simple layperson question. Why does that remain difficult? Uh, we're a big, it's a big country. Okay. And um, I think that, you know, we've been talking about the digital divide in this country for over 20, 25 years, right? And um, yet we find ourselves in a place where literally millions and millions of American households still do not have basic uh, adoption of the internet, right? So they don't have access or they don't have the tools or the skills they need to get online. So we've been talking about it for 20 years. We finally have the resources and a lot of it at NTIA, our sister agencies as well, to finally do something structural about it. And that is a really, really big deal. It's hard, hard work because um, some of it is about really building broadband out to the high-speed internet, out to the, the places that need it. Some of it is about um, increasing adoption. We've had some real big successes already. Um, we gave out $1.7 billion last year in grants to tribal communities. The uh, vice president was uh, in South Carolina just last week announcing our Connecting Minority Communities grants. But the thing I'll say about this, and we don't really talk about, uh, I, I, I've been coming to state in that for a long time, it tends to be a kind of more policy-oriented conference. We haven't spent a lot of time, I feel like, in recent years talking about like how we do connectivity or as much as I think we should. I'm just here to say this is a big moment. 
we are not going to get tens of billions of dollars to do this again, right? Like this is our shot at getting everybody connected and we need a lot of help. And I really do feel like this is like generations before us connected everybody with water and electricity in America. They connect, they, we built the interstate highway system and this is our, this is our generation's big infrastructure project, right? This is our chance to connect everybody in the country with what they need to thrive in the modern digital economy. And we are gonna need everybody's help to do that. So I just, my probably biggest plea today is be engaged in this conversation because it is a big deal. It's the next couple of years and then it won't happen again. Quick question, you mentioned it being a big country. It obviously is. You were recently in Alaska doing yeah. sort of fact finding to figure out the sort of state of broadband there. One, just very quickly, what did you come away knowing that you didn't know going into that? Um, it's a huge challenge, but people are really into it. And I kind of had originally had this conception that like, you know, people didn't even really know what they were missing. I was in this village on the, uh, the tribal community on the banks of the Yukon River. You can only get there by boat or plane. I was sitting uh, talking to a 60 year old grandmother who lived in this village for her entire life. And I sort of like, what are you, you know, thinking like, what are you using the internet for? What do, you, what do you think you might use the internet for? She could cite me exactly how much per gigabit she pays in overage charges right now for this little 30 megabit uh, uh, connection that they share among 200 people that comes in over a microwave and doesn't really work that well in the winter. So it's not that people have no idea. They're very sophisticated. They want this and it's going to transform their lives. And that's what she said to me that the difference between having this tiny little connection that she pays $700 a month for versus the gigabit per second connection that we are going to provide when we run fiber up the Yukon River, which we're doing, is going to be transformative for that village and it's going to be transformative for people. And that's the biggest thing I came with. So you have this vision. The president has set out this vision. Congress has set out this vision. It's up to you now to make some difficult decisions about how you actually build out to all those places that don't currently have high quality broadband. Right. One of the points of debate right now is this Buy America, uh, Buy American provision. The president in the State of Union said pretty clearly, when we build out these projects, we're going to Buy American. You followed that up with a blog post saying, in the past, administrations have, we've had the law since 1933 saying we have to buy American when it comes to these projects. Past administrations have ignored that we won't. People in the telecom world are looking at that and saying, really? Does he mean it? They're trying to figure out how serious you are about that. Well, the president made it pretty clear. We're pretty serious. Um, we're pretty serious and we're going to look at it case by case. But I think the, the key thing is, you know, he said it very explicitly about fiber and fiber optic cable. And we do believe that industry is stepping up building the manufacturing capability that we need and want. At the end of the day, this is about, uh, in addition to connectivity, it's also about incentivizing Ameri more American jobs, more American manufacturing. We know, and we've offered waivers before in some of these programs that telecommunications networks are high. But I think what you heard is that the bar is going to be high for those waivers. What if it delays a project three years? Uh, the bar is high, but not impossible. Okay. Um, let's switch gears a little bit to what we do with the internet once we actually have a connection. You've started engaging, NTIA has started engaging on this privacy debate that's been going on for a long time. You, as everyone in this room probably well knows, that Congress has struggled to pass any sort of, you know, comprehensive uh, privacy legislation. In the absence of that, what leverage does an agency like NTI have over a company, say like Google, where you spent seven years? If they don't have that sort of legislation hanging over them, how much leverage do you really have? Well, I think there's a couple of different pieces to it. I think there are um, real enforcement opportunities and you saw the FTC, for example, out with its advance notice of proposed rulemaking. We filed comments in that, we have a view. And I think the starting point for this is just as the president said in his Wall Street Journal article in the State of the Union, we need stronger privacy protections for people everywhere in the country. And federal privacy legislation is the right place for us to be in the end. Um, in the meantime, we're going to do as much as we can to shine light on the problems that are out there, push for more, greater enforcement, and ultimately support legislation as it comes along. Uh, one of the key things that we're doing at NTIA, for example, is uh, we put out a request for comment on privacy, equity, and civil rights. So we're doing a real investigation into the civil rights and equity aspects of privacy. What we've uh, 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 we have a, this request for comment is out and it's actually due today. So for those who didn't know about it, there's still time. Operators are standing by <laughs> till midnight tonight. Midnight. Um, and, uh, but, but the point is that the, some of the 
you know, the, the harms of privacy and security vulnerabilities are sort of most starkly felt by our most vulnerable communities. And so uh, the elderly, the poor, some of our minority communities really feel these harms and we need to be lifting up those issues and trying to get our enforcers and Congress to do something about it. One of the questions in that request for comment was, is privacy the right thing to call it? When we talk about the sort of like equity and civil rights implications of scraping photos off the internet for some facial recognition engine, maybe that's not a privacy concern anymore. Is it the right thing to call it or do we need a new sort of framework for thinking about this? Well, I still am a, uh, maybe old school. I kind of believe that privacy is still something that people understand and actually do care about. Um, some of this is maybe starts to feel like ownership is an interesting example, or is this property, is my data, you know, it's my data, my choice, um, uh, you know, uh, but I do think my experience actually as a parent, for example, is that the, the kids today do actually care about their privacy. They care about it differently than maybe some of us in this room grew up caring about it, but they're very attuned to who knows what about them, who sees what in the posts that they do. And uh, we need to make sure that everybody's got the tools that a lot of these kids are developing to uh, manage themselves, their presence online. And then we also need to take this, it's not, should not be on consumers to figure this out. A lot of this needs to be on business. And a lot of this needs to be about making sure we've got rules of the road that we've been lacking for years. Let's shift gears a little bit, talk about the global role, role that NTIA has. There was recently uh, a um, an effort on the part of the US to uh, install somebody at the head of the International Telecommunications Union, uh, who is an American, who actually an anti NTIA alumna. An, uh, NTIA alumna, yes, uh, uh, Doreen Bogdan Martin. It was a, a sort Started of, her career at NTIA, so yeah. So it was a- uh, We got a whoop whoop in the back. What's that? Uh, there was a whoop whoop oh, in the back. Oh, uh, okay. summer. <laughs> she back? No. Um, <laughs> there was, uh, it, it was not a, um, a sure thing that the American candidate would sort of um, win that election, the Russian candidate was sort of like the, the um, putting up a good fight. How do, you were pretty intimately involved um, in that effort. How did you actually achieve victory there? Uh, you know, I think it was the forces of lightness and truth. <laughs> uh, now, um, it was an important election and I think it was important on two different levels. At the end, you know, uh, well, uh, the big picture was, you know, we're really, this, the ITU is an important international body. And there's been a real open question about its direction and whether it would become a tool for some of the more closed and repressive societies to start to regulate the internet more, make the internet more closed, more authoritarian. And um, you had uh, this great American candidate, Doreen Bogdan Martin, running against um, a Russian candidate who was a former Huawei executive, sort of like straight out of um, mm -hmm. central casting for us in terms of... Uh, <laughs> um, and the dorkiest superhero. Yeah, and, um, but, uh, you know, so I think it was a bit of a proxy for the future of the ITU. And then at the end of the day, it is also about this candidate, Doreen Bogdan Martin, who is an incredible leader, uh, has a long history at the ITU promoting development uh, of communications around the world. And um, the first woman to be elected as head of the ITU in 157 years, which is kind of crazy. So um, I will say the US government put a lot of energy into that, this campaign with other governments. Uh, private industry and civil society stepped up too. And in the end, I was, I was in Bucharest uh, in the room when the vote happened. And I, I mean, for a lot of people who've been involved in the ITU for a long time, it was an emotional, it was an emotional moment to see, um, to see that choice made about its future, but also to see a woman, I think for a, from, for a lot of folks from a lot of countries, that was an incredibly meaningful thing to finally see uh, that historic pick. And people were, I mean, it was emotional in the room. So I'm glad we were able to do it. And now the ITU's in, it's in great hands. There's a great leadership team there. And I think Doreen ha, uh, has a real vision for how the ITU can help connect the next billion people online. So I think we have time for one more before coffee break. Okay. You have arguably a unique perspective in the DC tech and telecom world in that you've served in industry, in government, in civil society, and pretty like high level capacities in each of those. When you look at the, you know, clearly the country has struggled a little bit on, on federal privacy legislation, advancing some of the, you know, even agreed upon vision that people have in this country for tech and telecom. If you sort of had a magic wand to, to recreate from scratch the federal policymaking apparatus and the role that civil society, industry and government play, you no, know, this is a big question for the last 30 seconds. <laughs> what do we do? Well, what should we be doing differently? 
That is a big question. <laughs> um, I'd say the starting point has to be that the dream that we had 20 years ago or 30 years ago has actually come true in some ways. The internet has become the central medium, um, the essential communication medium of our time. And how do we make sure we're building um, our technology and our communications as a tool for human progress, right? How do we engage in this international conversation between the closed societies of the world and the open societies of the world? How do we make sure we're building technologies of freedom and not technologies of control? And building our federal apparatus to take on those big questions is part of what we need to do to adjust, to recognize these are issues that now affect people in their everyday lives. Um, I think we need more cross-cutting structures that can think in a deeper way about the implications of the technology that we're building and that can move more quickly to think about how we put the guardrails in place that will make us, allow us to innovate, but safely. Um, how we think about the long game of implications, right? Like I think back 20 or 30 years ago, you know, we made some really good choices I think about how we thought about the tech, the development of the internet, including like embracing innovation, embracing free expression, uh, giving people strong encryption tools to protect their privacy. Those were real choices we made. At the same time, there were things we missed. And I think we didn't see, we didn't imagine we would find ourselves 20 years later without a privacy law. I don't think we saw what was going to happen with disinformation in the world. And um, how do we develop the capacity within government to think deeply about where technology is going and also about the economic implications? Like um, I look at artificial intelligence, think about job dislocations, think about how that's going to affect uh, a lot of our economic structures. So we need those deeper capacities that cut across. Um, you could have a lot of debates about which where it should be built. We're trying to build a center of excellence at NTIA to think about these things. But I think, uh, I think back to my first job, my first policy job in Washington was at the Office of Technology Assessment, which doesn't exist anymore. But it was this beautiful organization uh, that uh, brought together experts in technology and policy to think deeply about the implications of the choices we had about technology. We need more structures like that, and we need more people who can come into government who have this crossover, understand technology and public policy. You heard it already multiple times today. We need more spectrum engineers. We need more data scientists. We're getting really good at service delivery. We still need that dual competency, that crossover of people who can speak technology and understand it and also understand public policy. And um, those people can come from lots of different walks of life. You people are those people. And so I just say, we need your help. We need more people like all of you, and we need your engagement on all these big issues. And that's the biggest thing I think we need to do in federal government, get more of that capacity. Okay. Well, I don't, it hasn't always been accurate to say you should keep an eye on NTIA um, in this space, <laughs> but <it's, laughs> you should keep an eye on NTIA in this space. So thank you so much, Alan. It's a good moment. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> I am stupid.